Hello, this is Mark Tooley, editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy, with the pleasure this evening of speaking with our contributing editor and great mind, Joseph Laconte, who is now at the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C., and is himself uh, an expert on the topic about which we'll discuss, which is this week's um, 75th anniversary of the official end of World War II with the September 2nd ceremony, surrender ceremony of Japan in Tokyo Bay with General Douglas MacArthur presiding magisterially. A momentous event, one of the chief events of the world in the last 100 years. What are its implications for today's America and for today's Christians? Joe Lacanti, welcome, and what are your insightful thoughts? Well, Mark, it's terrific to be with you. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, and thank you for drawing attention to this, as you rightly describe it, a momentous event, not just for the United States, but really for world history, uh, for civilization itself. Because at the end of the Second World War, unlike at the end of the First World War, the United States consciously, deliberately, and I, I would argue from a, a very strong moral perspective, it assumes a position of global leadership in order to try to defend and advance democratic values and democratic institutions, because there are amazing threats that then emerge really immediately at the end of the Second World War. And of course, they've been, they've been brewing here with the Soviet Union and communism uh, long before the end of the Second World War. So it's a remarkable moment, uh, an incredibly impressive moment, I would argue, of American political and cultural leadership. And we'll unpack it, I'm sure. And uh, speaking spiritually and theologically, could we say that this moment is also a, a triumph of uh, Anglo-Protestant civilization, the Anglo-American powers having defeated the Japanese empire and of course uh, the Third Reich and asserting themselves as the dominant powers uh, in 1945? Well, that's certainly how Winston Churchill would have described it and did describe it. And Margaret Thatcher, who also de described it as well, who was a great student of Churchill. Um, and when we talk about the Anglo-American kind of triumph here, what we're really talking about are the, are the highest ideals, political, moral, religious ideals uh, of our civilization, I would argue, embodied in, in these two great democratic countries. And of course, they not only fought together in the uh, Second World War, fought side by side, uh, helped to plan, execute the Normandy invasion of northern France, which was so decisive in defeating Hitler uh, on the continent. But so not only fought together, but then began to try to sort out how do we restructure the, the, the new world order after the end of the, of the Second World War with the collapse of Nazi Germany, and then together facing the new great ideological threat, which of course is Soviet communism. And there it's Winston Churchill, who publicly at least is really the first democratic leader to, to warn uh, uh, in, a, in, I think, a, a profoundly important way of the iron curtain of Soviet communism descending upon all of Eastern Europe. I mean, that's in, my friend, you know, that's right after the Second World War. We're getting that kind of warning coming from, from Churchill. Harry Truman, to his credit, who succeeds uh, Franklin Roosevelt after his death, Harry Truman, as a Democrat, I think there's a realism, a moral realism uh, that, uh, that Truman had that Franklin Roosevelt, frankly, lacked. So th there is, and I, I know we'll get into it, there is a kind of Christian realism at work, I believe, in American foreign policy at this moment that did not exist, you could argue, in the decades leading up to the Second World War. So perhaps how America handled the triumph of 1945 was directly a consequence and a lesson from the mistakes and failures from 1918, 1919. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Mark. I think those, those, that decade of appeasement, uh, in particular the 1930s, with W.H. W. Auden called it a low, dishonest decade, the giving in to, to fascist aggression at every turn. Um, and so I think there really were lessons learned. Truman had a ringside seat to all of that. Um, and so, so did Ronald Reagan, by the way. We may get into Reagan before we're done, who's, who, of course, lived through that period. And he voted for Franklin Roosevelt, you know, every time that he could. But then he saw the betrayal, the betrayal at Yalta, 
the agreements made with Joseph Stalin in 1945, before the end of the Second World War, the agreements to allow democratic elections uh, in Eastern Europe, the promises that Stalin made, and he broke every single one of those promises. And Truman was not going to let that stand. He was then going to do everything he could to push back against Soviet aggression. And so it's the Truman Doctrine that comes into play to contain Soviet communism, announced right essentially, <laughs> you know, with his coming into a, a power in the presidency. It's the Marshall Plan, uh, also a, a product of Truman's thinking and George Marshall, his Secretary of State, to, to try to rescue Western Europe from the clutches of the Soviet Union. Th these are tremendous acts of statesmanship, it seems to me, uh, in those moments, really moments, uh, after the, the end of the Second World War. Well, you would be disappointed in me, Joseph, if I did not push back on your veiled criticism of, F of FDR. Not so veiled. <laughs> <laughs> and I will, in fact, uh, assert that FDR himself was a Christian realist of sort and had been uh, in the front seat of the Woodrow Wilson administration and saw the consequences of uh, untrammeled uh, idealism and I think was determined to at the same time push for American ideals, but also to, to understand the world as it is and as it was and to create a world system that acknowledged a balance of power and not just relying upon pure idealism. Well, if I may gently uh, push back against your pushback, if I could, my friend, I would argue that to characterize Franklin Roosevelt's policies leading up to Pearl Harbor as Christian realist policies, I would have to argue that is a degradation, a degradation of the phrase Christian realism, which uh, I, I expect better from you, my friend, much better from you. <laughs> well, I would, uh, I think if you look at the quiet record of FDR behind the scenes doing everything he could to sustain Great Britain, in fact, being called by Churchill, uh, uh, Britain's best friend, <laughs> in fact, having to work through a very un often unsupportive and uncooperative uh, public opinion in the U.S., isn't that the essence of Christian realism, having to work <laughs> with people as they are instead of as we wish they would be? Well, we'll have to pick up this discussion, I'm sure, about uh, the alleged Christian realist credentials of Franklin Roosevelt. But certainly, by the, by the end of his life and his tenure as president, before he dies, he does realize, and he says with great regret, Stalin broke every promise he made to me. There certainly is an awareness uh, uh, at the end. And there is certainly a kind of real politique, hardcore political realism going on at Yalta. We'll have to discuss more either now or later on uh, how much Christian realism is involved in that Yalta agreement when Stalin, Churchill, and, and, and FDR are trying to sort out the new world order in the months leading up to the end of the Second World War. You and I will agree that it's very unfortunate that uh, the victory over Japan or that uh, the end of World War II is not being appropriately commemorated right now because of coronavirus and other circumstances in that so much of our conversation today focuses upon the evils of the United States of America, yeah. real and imagined, and we forget much wider yes. gargantuan evils. Yes. There's still a memory, obviously, of uh, Hitler's Germany's uh, mass murders, but in terms of uh, militarist Japan, and yes. millions of people, it's, uh, it's slaughtered um, throughout the Pacific, uh, yes. perhaps 17, 18, 19 million in China alone, and how those horrors were finally yes. brought to a halt, yes. thanks to American and Anglo power. Uh, we can't forget uh, those, um, what happened 75 and 80 years ago. That's exactly right, friend, especially now. Not only can we not, we must remember. I mean, the, the American occupation of Germany uh, after the Second World War and of Japan, you don't have to be a neoconservative to appreciate uh, the, the, the staggering success of, 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 the, of those achievements, of those efforts. I mean, you have a democratic Germany, a democratic Japan, two deeply fascist troubled countries throughout the 1930s and 40s really transformed, not simply because they lost uh, uh, the war, but because of American and, and secondarily uh, British influence. So that is an incredible achievement in terms of American foreign policy. And I would also argue, uh, for the benefit of our European friends who may be watching the broadcast, uh, the European Union owes its very existence to the American triumph uh, in the Second World War and the establishment of an American-British world order, you could argue, 
uh, in the way that we orchestrated uh, the, uh, the United Nations, the new international organizations that are formed, and of course, providing the, the security umbrella for Europe through NATO, the formation of NATO 1947-1948. So just within a few years of the end of the Second World War, not only is America not retreating from the world stage, it's determined to leave its democratic imprint upon these new international organizations that it is creating and it is funding. And it's a, it's a, it's a season of American leadership that is probably almost unparalleled, really, in the history of the West, a force for good, with our British allies, of course, uh, at our side at every turn. Not just in Western history, but uh, is there any other parallel in human history uh, for two uh, nations or, or uh, regimes like the Third Reich and militarist Japan to have undergone essentially an exorcism and having been uh, delivered from their evils and uh, renounced them and becoming uh, really uh, remarkably faithful wow. disciples of uh, democracy as understood through the prism of the American Anglo wow. experience. Uh, I can't, most uh, great uh, triumphs involve some kind of uh, Roman Carthaginian peace where the victor yes. sows salt in the, uh, in the fields of uh, the loser and uh, yes. the, 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 those who have lost are forever vanquished. But uh, yes. this was a victory of where great goodwill was extended to the losers and the yes. fruit of that goodwill, uh, we've uh, reaped that fruit for the last 75 years. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. You really can't think of any historic parallels that speak into that kind of moment. I mean, certainly the conversion of the Roman Empire through Christianity and the advance of the gospel was an, is an amazing historical development, isn't it? The, and, and how Rome became civilized and made it more, much more humane because of the influence of Christianity and then, of course, the emergence of Christendom. You could argue that the American Civil War, and it's still an evolving uh, experiment, isn't it? The South loses that war, and then there is the gradual transformation of the South. Uh, and we might just say parenthetically, the transformation of the Democratic Party, which was the pro-segregation party, the pro-racist party, the pro-Ku Klux Klan party, that was the Democratic Party for most of its history. It has finally come around to the Republican Party position on these questions. It's taken a while, but it's done that. That's, a, that's an amazing transformation, we, we could say parenthetically as well. But certainly, these two nations, Germany and Japan, the way that they're transformed because of American influence and goodwill is an astonishing historical achievement, and we need to remember it. And should we be concerned about seemingly a rising current in American politics and public opinion of uh, maybe indifference uh, to overseas alliances, especially including our partnerships with Japan and Germany? That's a terrific question. And it's a little, it's a little difficult to know how it's going to play out, isn't it? it however, the election here turns out in November. Um, in some ways, you could argue that America has shown some significant leadership uh, in, uh, with, the, with respect, say, to Iran, to China. Uh, we, could, we could certainly debate the, uh, the effect we're having on Russia and its aggression. Um, I have to say that this is a challenging time because we, um, we Americans, you know, we're, we're naturally kind of inwardly focused, aren't we? We just want to get on with it, get on with our own democratic uh, civic lives and not be so engaged in the world unless we really have a, a personal stake in it. That's our kind of natural impulse, I think, as Americans. And so I think this is a challenging time because we've, the, the coronavirus, of course, has us so focused inwardly. The, our own econo economic crisis has us so focused inwardly. And I think it's gonna be a challenge to kind of sustain some kind of more global a careful, prudent, Christian, realist, democratic vision outside of our borders. That's a challenging thing to do. Uh, we've had two, um, how do we describe the wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq? Uncertain, right? And, and the results are still uncertain. And they've caused great division in this country. And the tendency, the natural human tendency is to pendulum swing in the other direction uh, and to repudiate any kind of American uh, uh, influence. Uh, in the world. I don't think that we've done that, but that, that, that impulse and that political impulse is there. It's alive in our body politic. And I think it has to be checked because nature abhors a vacuum and the vacuum of American leadership, you know, serious, prudent, morally grounded American political leadership, the vacuum of that 
it will be filled by dark forces. That's the historical pattern, isn't it? We were absolutely right about this a pendulum uh, in American opinion. Now, you and I are both uh, almost old enough to remember the pendulum swing of the 1970s, the lessons of Vietnam. Yep. And uh, we took that to an exaggerated uh, extent in terms of American withdrawal and that uh, we must never again involve ourselves in overseas involvements. And of course, yep. the pendulum did swing back in the 1980s. And I suppose with the end of the Cold War, uh, there was a a hubris and overconfidence that led to exaggerated yeah. expectations about Iraq yeah. and Afghanistan. And now the pendulum swings back to yeah. almost a 1970s perspective. It's a terrific po point, Mark. We, we sometimes draw the wrong lessons from our military victories and our military defeats. We drew, I think we drew, drew too many lessons from Vietnam, quote unquote, too many lessons from Afghanistan and Iraq, quote unquote. But you could argue that the end of the Second World War, it was such a triumph, right, to defeat fascism, uh, on, on two fronts, Japanese fascism and German Italian. I mean, that was an amazing accomplishment to turn the American economy into an effective war machine. But you could argue that some of those generals then, as they looked at other places in the world, they thought that the American military could work miracles everywhere. So we weren't really prepared the way we should have been initially in Korea. We, we brought that to a satisfactory kind of conclusion and stalemate. But then I think we had a number of generals brought into the Kennedy administration uh, you know, these bright young things who thought we can just roll over the communists uh, in Vietnam, just send in the Marines and they'll just collapse in fear and, uh, and trembling. It wasn't going to happen. We didn't understand the enemy. And I think we overestimated what the American military could do in every uh, uh, situation, nation building in Vietnam while you're trying to defeat this communist insurgency. It wasn't going to work out that way. An overconfidence again, I think. Well, that's right. And it said that uh, part of uh, President Nixon's attitude towards uh, Vietnam was uh, after World War II, as a young congressman visiting Western Europe, he saw the uh, enormous destruction wrought by the uh, American Air Force upon the cities of Japan. And he just uh, perhaps uh, assumed that that same level of destruction, if wrought against uh, North Vietnam, could yeah. um, render a similar victory. And it was yes. a very different kind of war. Exactly right, friend. And we, we dropped more bomb tonnage on Vietnam, on North Vietnam, uh, than we dropped on the, uh, the Axis powers during the Second World War. Stop and think about that. More bomb tonnage from the air than throughout the entire Second World War, and the communists did not relent. It was a, it was a different kind of enemy. And perhaps there's also a, um, an attitude of uh, ingratitude in terms of uh, World War II, and that uh, we're endlessly uh, impatient with uh, Japanese and German um, reluctance to increase their military capacities, and obviously with some justification, but there yep. was a time when millions and millions and millions of people around the world would have been very grateful that uh, Japan and Germany had become semi-pacifist and <laughs> would have prayed for that day, and here yep. we have achieved it, and we yep. have to cajole these once great militarist powers just to defend themselves. Yeah, yeah, that is a kind of an irony, isn't it, my friend? The uh... Not only Japan and Germany uh, learning to defend themselves, but you could argue so many of our European allies who've not invested in their own uh, defense systems, right? I mean, you're, you're hard pressed to, f to find uh, any kind of significant airlift, just airlift capability among the European countries. I remember this became an issue uh, during the, uh, the debate over Darfur and Sudan in trying to rescue p people from the attacks that were being leveled uh, against villagers. And uh, Kofi Annan at the United Nations, you know, begging, begging the Europeans for just some airlift, some helicopters, and he couldn't get them. He just couldn't get them. The United States has that kind of capability. We, we continue to invest, outstrip all of our allies this way. So, yeah, preparation for, for war, as Churchill said, uh, paraphrasing Churchill, preparation for war is one of the keys to keeping the peace and, and deterring your enemy. So, you're right. And finally, Joe, uh, as we uh, conclude, in terms of uh, lessons of World War II, uh, in this current moment uh, for America, the militants in the streets who uh, believe America is uh, evil incarnate, and they are a relative few, but yet the, that attitude obviously is echoed among a large slice of America's elites, especially in academia, yeah. who are hard-pressed to come up uh, with 
redeeming yeah. values uh, for America, which they characterize yeah. as intrinsically racist, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, uh, yeah. World War II could not have been won without the arsenal of democracy. And democracy around the world today, in large part, depends upon the projection of American power. So how do we um, transmit this message of the importance of um, America, its power, and its principles to uh, doubtful, skeptical, and unknowing Americans today? That is a fabulous question. I have a two-part answer just to take a stab at it. One would be uh, someone ne needs to make a film that's kind of the political equivalent of it. Uh, uh, it's a Wonderful Life, Jimmy Stewart, and try to imagine what the world will be like without the influence and the presence of the United States. Just play it out, region after region, situation after situation. Here's what the world will look like without us. Play it out in a film. That's one idea. The other thing we can continue to do, and I've had the, pr uh, the uh, privilege now of seeing some of this uh, back at the Heritage Foundation, uh, you tend to meet people at Heritage and in the conservative movement who uh, they, ha they have fled formerly communist countries. They grew up in Eastern Europe, and they know what it's like to grow up uh, under, a, under a, a Soviet communist totalitarian system. They have that memory, either themselves, their parents and grandparents, and they're part of that kind of conservative movement that I'm very much now a part of at Heritage. And boy, they love freedom, and they certainly have a, a, a deep, deep gratitude and love for the United States, because it, it, it was that great beacon of hope, that great city on the hill for people behind the Iron Curtain for decades, for decades. So we need to keep telling those stories as well, I think is another way to do it. Joseph Lacanti, historian and uh, scholar of Americana, Thank you for a very enjoyable conversation. Great to be with you, Mark, and I look forward to uh, taking up the debate with you over the uh, legacy of Franklin Roosevelt. That will be our next rep-roaring conversation. <laughs> Terrific. Okay, Mark, take care, brother.